Hey, this is the Coach in Asia and IRFM. All right, now. You see this book here? This book here is about 14 hours long. But it comes in sections. So, you know, so we can't play the whole 14 hours. You understand? We're going to play the first half hour of the book. Only a theory. As we said, this is um, a man by the name of Richard Dawkins. Talking about evolution and his case for evolution, not against evolution, for evolution. He must show why. He must say it is not a theory. It has been proven without, it would be on the shadow of doubt. You understand? That the creation story as written in the Bible can go so, not no go so. So, Richard Dawkins. First time on Jamaican radio, you're going to hear them something, you know. <laughs> you understand? Yes. Jamaican radio to that. So here goes. Richard Dawkins, Evolution. This is the first part of the book. We're going to play. The title is Only a Theory. That's the title. Ready? Chapter 1. Only a Theory. Imagine that you are a teacher of Roman history and the Latin language anxious to impart your enthusiasm for the ancient world, for the elegiacs of Ovid and the odes of Horace, the sinewy economy of Latin grammar as exhibited in the oratory of Cicero, the strategic niceties of the Punic Wars, the generalship of Julius Caesar, and the voluptuous excesses of the later emperors. That's a big undertaking, and it takes time, concentration, dedication, Yet you find your precious time continually preyed upon, and your class's attention distracted by a baying pack of ignoramuses, as a Latin scholar you would know better than to say ignorami, who, with strong political and especially financial support, scurry about tirelessly attempting to persuade your unfortunate pupils that the Romans never existed, that there never was a Roman Empire. The entire world came into existence only just beyond living memory. Spanish, Italian, French, Portuguese, Catalan, Occitan, Romanche. All these languages and their constituent dialects sprang spontaneously and separately into being and owe nothing to any predecessor such as Latin. Instead of devoting your full attention to the noble vocation of classical scholar and teacher, you are forced to divert your time and energy to a rearguard defense of the proposition that the Romans existed at all. A defense against an exhibition of ignorant prejudice that would make you weep if you weren't too busy fighting it. If our fantasy of the Latin teacher seems too wayward, here's a more realistic example. Imagine you are a teacher of more recent history and your lessons on 20th century Europe are boycotted, heckled or otherwise disrupted by well-organized, well-financed and politically muscular groups of Holocaust deniers. Unlike my hypothetical Rome deniers, Holocaust deniers really exist. They are vocal, superficially plausible and adept at seeming learned. They are supported by the president of at least one currently powerful state and they include at least one bishop of the Roman Catholic Church. Imagine that, as a teacher of European history, you are continually faced with belligerent demands to teach the controversy and to give equal time to the alternative theory that the Holocaust never happened but was invented by a bunch of Zionist fabricators. Fashionably, relativist intellectuals chime in to insist that there is no absolute truth. Whether the Holocaust happened is a matter of personal belief. All points of view are equally valid and should be equally respected. The plight of many science teachers today is not less dire. When they attempt to expound the central and guiding principle of biology, when they honestly place the living world in its historical context, which means evolution, when they explore and explain the very nature of life itself, they are harried and stymied, hassled and bullied, even threatened with loss of their jobs. At the very least, their time is wasted at every turn. They are likely to receive menacing letters from parents and have to endure the sarcastic smirks, 
and close-folded arms of brainwashed children. They are supplied with state-approved textbooks that have had the word evolution systematically expunged or bowdlerized into change over time. Once we were tempted to laugh this kind of thing off as a peculiarly American phenomenon. Teachers in Britain and Europe now face the same problems, partly because of American influence, but more significantly because of the growing Islamic presence in the classroom, abetted by the official commitment to multiculturalism and the terror of being thought racist. It is frequently and rightly said that senior clergy and theologians have no problem with evolution and in many cases actively support scientists in this respect. This is often true, as I know from the agreeable experience of collaborating with the then Bishop of Oxford, now Lord Harris, on two separate occasions. In 2004, we wrote a joint article in the Sunday Times whose concluding words were, Nowadays, there is nothing to debate. Evolution is a fact, and from a Christian perspective, one of the greatest of God's works. The last sentence was written by Richard Harris, but we agreed about all the rest of our article. Two years previously, Bishop Harris and I had organized a joint letter to the then Prime Minister, Tony Blair, that read as follows. Dear Prime Minister, We write as a group of scientists and bishops to express our concern about the teaching of science in the Emmanuel City Technology College in Gateshead. Evolution is a scientific theory of great explanatory power able to account for a wide range of phenomena in a number of disciplines. It can be refined, confirmed, and even radically altered by attention to evidence. It is not, as spokesmen for the college maintain, a faith position, in the same category as the biblical account of creation, which has a different function and purpose. The issue goes wider than what is currently being taught in one college. There is a growing anxiety about what will be taught and how it will be taught in the new generation of proposed faith schools. We believe that the curricula in such schools, as well as that of Emmanuel City Technology College, need to be strictly monitored in order that the respective disciplines of science and religious studies are properly respected. Yours sincerely, the Right Reverend Richard Harris, Bishop of Oxford, Sir David Attenborough, FRS, the Right Reverend Christopher Herbert, Bishop of St Albans, Lord May of Oxford, President of the Royal Society, Professor John Enderby, FRS, Physical Secretary, Royal Society, the Right Reverend John Oliver, Bishop of Hereford, the Right Reverend Mark Santa, Bishop of Birmingham, Sir Neil Chalmers, Director, Natural History Museum, the Right Reverend Thomas Butler, Bishop of Southwark, Sir Martin Rees, FRS, Astronomer Royal, the Right Reverend Kenneth Stevenson, Bishop of Portsmouth, Professor Patrick Bateson, FRS, Biological Secretary, Royal Society, the Right Reverend Crispian Hollis, Roman Catholic Bishop of Portsmouth, Sir Richard Southwood, FRS, Sir Francis Graham Smith, FRS, Past Physical Secretary, Royal Society, Professor Richard Dawkins, FRS. Bishop Harris and I organized this letter in a hurry. As far as I remember, the signatories to the letter constituted 100% of those we approached. There was no disagreement, either from scientists or from bishops. The Archbishop of Canterbury has no problem with evolution, nor does the Pope give or take the odd wobble over the precise paleontological juncture when the human soul was injected, nor do educated priests and professors of theology. This is a book about the positive evidence that evolution is a fact. It is not intended as an anti-religious book. I've done that, it's another t-shirt, this is not the place to wear it again. Bishops and theologians who have attended to the evidence for evolution have given up the struggle against it. Some may do so reluctantly, some like Richard Harris enthusiastically, but all except the woefully uninformed are forced to accept the fact of evolution. God did it! They may think God had a hand in starting the process off, and perhaps didn't stay his hand in guiding its future progress. They probably think God cranked the universe up in the first place and solemnized its birth with a harmonious set of laws and physical constants calculated to fulfill some inscrutable purpose in which we were eventually to play a role. 
but, grudgingly in some cases, happily in others, thoughtful and rational churchmen and women accept the evidence for evolution. What we must not do is complacently assume that, because bishops and educated clergy accept evolution, so do their congregations. Alas, as I have documented in the appendix, there is ample evidence to the contrary from opinion polls. More than 40% of Americans deny that humans evolved from other animals and think that we, and by implication all of life, were created by God within the last 10,000 years. The figure is not quite so high in Britain, but it is still worryingly large, and it should be as worrying to the churches as it is to scientists. This book is necessary. I shall be using the name History Deniers for those people who deny evolution, who believe the world's age is measured in thousands of years rather than thousands of millions of years, and who believe humans walked with dinosaurs. To repeat, they constitute more than 40% of the American population. The equivalent figure is higher in some countries, lower in others, but 40% is a good average, and I shall from time to time refer to the history deniers as the 40 percenters. To return to the enlightened bishops and theologians, it would be nice if they'd put a bit more effort into combating the anti-scientific nonsense that they deplore. All too many preachers, while agreeing that evolution is true and Adam and Eve never existed, will then blithely go into the pulpit and make some moral or theological point about Adam and Eve in their sermons, without once mentioning that, of course, Adam and Eve never actually existed. If challenged, they will protest that they intended a purely symbolic meaning, perhaps something to do with original sin or the virtues of innocence. They may add witheringly that obviously nobody would be so foolish as to take their words literally. But do their congregations know that? How is the person in the pew or on the prayer mat supposed to know which bits of scripture to take literally, which symbolically? Is it really so easy for an uneducated churchgoer to guess? In all too many cases, the answer is clearly no, and anybody could be forgiven for feeling confused. Think about it, Bishop. Be careful, Vicar. You are playing with dynamite, fooling around with a misunderstanding that's waiting to happen. One might even say almost bound to happen, if not forestalled. Shouldn't you take greater care when speaking in public to let your yea be yea and your nay be nay? Lest ye fall into condemnation, shouldn't you be going out of your way to counter that already The history deniers themselves are among those that I am trying to reach in this book. But, perhaps more importantly, I aspire to arm those who are not history deniers but know some, perhaps members of their own family or church, and find themselves inadequately prepared to argue the case. Evolution is a fact. Beyond reasonable doubt, beyond serious doubt, beyond sane, informed, intelligent doubt, beyond doubt, evolution is a fact. The evidence for evolution is at least as strong as the evidence for the Holocaust, even allowing for eyewitnesses to the Holocaust. It is the plain truth that we are cousins of chimpanzees, somewhat more distant cousins of monkeys, more distant cousins still of aardvarks and manatees, yet more distant cousins of bananas and turnips, Continue the list as long as desired. That didn't have to be true. It is not self-evidently, tautologically, obviously true. And there was a time when most people, even educated people, thought it wasn't. It didn't have to be true, but it is. We know this because a rising flood of evidence supports it. Evolution is a fact, and this book will demonstrate it. No reputable scientist disputes it, and no unbiased listener will reach the end of the book doubting it. Why then do we speak of Darwin's theory of evolution, thereby, it seems, giving spurious comfort to those of a creationist persuasion, the history deniers, the forty percenters, who think the word theory is a concession, handing them some kind of gift or victory? What is a theory? What is a fact? Only a theory? Let's look at what theory means. The Oxford English Dictionary gives two meanings, actually more, but these are the two that matter here. Theory, sense one. A scheme or system of ideas or statements 
held as an explanation or account of a group of facts or phenomena, a hypothesis that has been confirmed or established by observation or experiment and is propounded or accepted as accounting for the known facts. A statement of what are held to be the general laws, principles or causes of something known or observed. Theory Sense 2 a hypothesis proposed as an explanation, hence a mere hypothesis, speculation, conjecture, an idea or set of ideas about something, an individual view or notion. Obviously the two meanings are quite different from one another, and the short answer to my question about the theory of evolution is that the scientists are using sense one, while the creationists are, perhaps mischievously, perhaps sincerely, opting for sense two. A good example of sense one is the heliocentric theory of the solar system, the theory that Earth and the other planets orbit the Sun. Evolution fits sense one perfectly. Darwin's theory of evolution is indeed a scheme or system of ideas or statements. It does account for a massive group of facts or phenomena. It is a hypothesis that has been confirmed or established by observation or experiment. And by generally informed consent, it is a statement of what are held to be the general laws, principles, or causes of something known or observed. It is certainly very far from a mere hypothesis, speculation, conjecture. Scientists and creationists are understanding the word theory in two very different senses. Evolution is a theory in the same sense as the heliocentric theory. In neither case should the word only be used, as in only a theory. As for the claim that evolution has never been proved, proof is a notion that scientists have been intimidated into mistrusting. Influential philosophers tell us we can't prove anything in science. Mathematicians can prove things. According to one strict view, they are the only people who can. But the best that scientists can do is fail to disprove things while pointing to how hard they tried. Even the undisputed theory that the moon is smaller than the sun cannot, to the satisfaction of a certain kind of philosopher, be proved in the way that, for example, the Pythagorean theorem can be proved. But massive accretions of evidence support it so strongly that to deny it the status of fact seems ridiculous to all but pedants. The same is true of evolution. Evolution is a fact in the same sense as it is a fact that Paris is in the Northern Hemisphere. Though logic choppers rule the town, not my favourite Yeats line, but apt in this case, some theories are beyond sensible doubt, and we call them facts. The more energetically and thoroughly you try to disprove a theory, if it survives the assault, the more closely it approaches what common sense happily calls a fact. Continent! I could carry on using theory sense one and theory sense two, but numbers are unmemorable. I need substitute words. We already have a good word for theory sense two. It is hypothesis. Everybody understands that a hypothesis is a tentative idea awaiting confirmation or falsification. And it is precisely this tentativeness that evolution has now shed, although it was still burdened with it in Darwin's time. Theory sense one is harder. It would be nice simply to go on using theory as though sense two didn't exist. Indeed, a good case could be made that sense two shouldn't exist, because it is confusing and unnecessary, given that we have hypothesis. Unfortunately, sense two of theory is in common use, and we can't by fear ban it. I am therefore going to take the considerable but just forgivable liberty of borrowing from mathematics the word theorem for sense one. This is the cutting edge and RFM coming true. Okay, so we want to continue this lecture here by this, this Virginia Richard Dawkins. Okay. It is actually a misborrowing, as we shall see, but I think the risk of confusion is outweighed by the benefits. As a gesture of appeasement towards affronted mathematicians, I'm going to change my spelling to theorem. For the sake of decorum, pronounce it theorem. 
First, let me explain the strict mathematical usage of theorem, while at the same time clarifying my earlier statement that, strictly speaking, only mathematicians are licensed to prove anything. Lawyers aren't, despite well-remunerated pretensions. To a mathematician, a proof is a logical demonstration that a conclusion necessarily follows from axioms that are assumed. Pythagoras' theorem is necessarily true, provided only that we assume Euclidean axioms, such as the axiom that parallel straight lines never meet. You are wasting your time measuring thousands of right-angled triangles trying to find one that falsifies Pythagoras' theorem. The Pythagoreans proved it. Anybody can work through the proof. It's just true, and that's that. Mathematicians use the idea of proof to make a distinction between a conjecture and a theorem, which bears a superficial resemblance to the OED's distinction between the two senses of theory. A conjecture is a proposition that looks true but has never been proved. It will become a theorem when it has been proved. A famous example is the Goldbach conjecture, which states that any even integer can be expressed as the sum of two primes. Mathematicians have failed to disprove it for all even numbers up to 300,000 million million million, and common sense would happily call it Goldbach's fact. Nevertheless, it has never been proved, despite lucrative prizes being offered for the achievement, and mathematicians rightly refuse to place it on the pedestal reserved for theorems. If anybody ever finds a proof, it will be promoted from Goldbach's conjecture to Goldbach's theorem, or maybe X's theorem, where X is the clever mathematician who finds the proof. Carl Sagan made sarcastic use of the Goldbach conjecture to people who claim to have been abducted by aliens. Occasionally, I get a letter from someone who is in contact with extraterrestrials. I am invited to ask them anything. And so, over the years, I've prepared a little list of questions. The extraterrestrials are very advanced, remember? So I ask things like, please provide a short proof of Fermat's last theorem, or the Goldbach conjecture. I never get an answer. On the other hand, if I ask something like, should we be good? I almost always get an answer. Anything vague, especially involving conventional moral judgments, these aliens are extremely happy to respond to. But on anything specific, where there is a chance to find out if they actually know anything beyond what most humans know, there is only silence. Fermat's last theorem, like the Goldbach conjecture, is a proposition about numbers to which nobody has found an exception. Proving it has been a kind of holy grail for mathematicians ever since 1637, when Pierre de Fermat wrote in the margin of an old mathematics book, I have a truly marvellous proof which this margin is too narrow to contain. It was finally proved by the English mathematician Andrew Wiles in 1995. Before that, some mathematicians think it should have been called a conjecture. Given the length and complication of Wiles' successful proof and his reliance on advanced 20th century methods and knowledge, most mathematicians think Fermat was, honestly, mistaken in his claim to have proved it. I tell the story only to illustrate the difference between a conjecture and a theorem. As I said, I'm going to borrow the mathematician's term theorem, but I'm spelling it theorem to differentiate from a mathematical theorem. A scientific theorem, such as evolution or heliocentrism, is a theory that conforms to the Oxford Dictionary's sense one. It has been confirmed or established by observation or experiment and is propounded or accepted as accounting for the known facts. It is a statement of what are held to be the general laws, principles, or causes of something known or observed. A scientific theorem has not been, cannot be, proved in the way a mathematical theorem is proved. But common sense treats it as a fact in the same sense as the theory that the Earth is round and not flat is a fact, and the theory that green plants obtain energy from the sun is a fact. 
All are scientific theorems, supported by massive quantities of evidence, accepted by all informed observers, undisputed facts in the ordinary sense of the word. As with all facts, if we're going to be pedantic, it is undeniably possible that our measuring instruments and the sense organs with which we read them are the victims of a massive confidence trick. As Bertrand Russell said, we may all have come into existence five minutes ago, provided with ready-made memories, with holes in our socks, and hair that needed cutting. Given the evidence now available, for evolution to be anything other than a fact would require a similar confidence trick by the Creator, something that few theists would wish to credit. It is now time to examine the dictionary definition of a fact. Here is what the OED has to say. Again, there are several definitions, but this is the relevant one. Fact. Something that has really occurred or is actually the case. Something certainly known to be of this character. Hence, a particular truth known by actual observation or authentic testimony, as opposed to what is merely inferred or to a conjecture or fiction. A datum of experience, as distinguished from the conclusions that may be based upon it. Notice that, like a theorem, a fact in this sense doesn't have the same rigorous status as a proved mathematical theorem, which follows inescapably from a set of assumed axioms. Moreover, actual observation or authentic testimony can be horribly fallible, and is overrated in courts of law. Psychological experiments have given us some stunning demonstrations which should worry any jurist inclined to give superior weight to eyewitness evidence. A famous example was prepared by Professor Daniel J. Simons at the University of Illinois. Half a dozen young people standing in a circle were filmed for 25 seconds tossing a pair of basketballs to each other and we, the experimental subjects, watched the film. The players weave in and out of the circle and change places as they pass and bounce the balls, so the scene is quite actively complicated. Before being shown the film, we're told that we have a task to perform to test our powers of observation. We have to count the total number of times balls are passed from person to person. At the end of the test, the counts are duly written down, but little does the audience know, this is not the real test. After showing the film and collecting the counts, the experimenter drops his bombshell. And how many of you saw the gorilla? The majority of the audience looked baffled, blank. The experimenter then replays the film, but this time tells the audience to watch in a relaxed fashion without trying to count anything. Amazingly, nine seconds into the film, a man in a gorilla suit strolls nonchalantly to the center of the circle of players, pauses to face the camera, thumps his chest as if in belligerent contempt for eyewitness evidence, and then strolls off with the same insouciance as before. One. He is there in full view for nine whole seconds, more than one third of the film, and yet the majority of the witnesses never see him. They would swear an oath in a court of law that no man in a gorilla suit was present and they would swear that they had been watching with more than usually acute concentration for the whole 25 seconds precisely because they were counting ball passes. Many experiments along these lines have been performed with similar results and with similar reactions of stupefied disbelief when the audience is finally shown the truth. Eyewitness testimony actual observation, a datum of experience, all are, or at least can be, hopelessly unreliable. It is, of course, exactly this unreliability among observers that stage conjurers exploit with their techniques of deliberate distraction. The dictionary definition of a fact mentions actual observation or authentic testimony as opposed to what is merely inferred. The implied pejorative of that merely is a bit of a cheek. Careful inference can be more reliable than actual observation, however strongly our intuition protests at admitting it. I myself was flabbergasted when I failed to see the Simon's gorilla, and frankly incredulous that it had really been there. 
Sadder and wiser after my second viewing of the film, I shall never again be tempted to give eyewitness testimony an automatic preference over indirect scientific inference. The gorilla film, or something like it, should perhaps be shown to all juries before they retire to consider their verdicts. All judges, too. Admittedly, inference has to be based ultimately on observation by our sense organs. For example, we use our eyes to observe the printout from a DNA sequencing machine or from the Large Hadron Collider. But, all intuition to the contrary, direct observation of an alleged event, such as a murder, as it actually happens, is not necessarily more reliable than indirect observation of its consequences, such as DNA in a bloodstain, fed into a well-constructed inference engine. Mistaken identity is more likely to arise from direct eyewitness testimony than from indirect inference derived from DNA evidence. And by the way, there is a distressingly long list of people who have been wrongly convicted on eyewitness testimony and subsequently freed, sometimes after many years, because of new evidence from DNA. In Texas alone, 35 condemned people have been exonerated since DNA evidence became admissible in court. And that's just the ones who are still alive. Given the gusto with which the state of Texas enforces the death penalty, during his six years as governor, George W. Bush signed a death warrant once a fortnight on average, we have to assume that a substantial number of executed people would have been exonerated if DNA evidence had been available in time for them. This book will take inference seriously, not mere inference, but proper scientific inference and I shall show the irrefragable power of the inference that evolution is a fact. Obviously, the vast majority of evolutionary change is invisible to direct eyewitness observation. Most of it happened before we were born, and in any case, it is usually too slow to be seen during an individual's lifetime. The same is true of the relentless pulling apart of Africa and South America, which occurs, as we shall see in Chapter 9, too slowly for us to notice. With evolution, as with continental drift, inference after the event is all that is available to us, for the obvious reason that we don't exist until after the event. But do not for one nanosecond underestimate the power of such inference. The slow drifting apart of South America and Africa is now an established fact in the ordinary language sense of fact. And so is our common ancestry with porcupines and pomegranates. We are like detectives who come on the scene after a crime has been committed. The murderer's actions have vanished into the past. The detective has no hope of witnessing the actual crime with his own eyes. In any case, the gorilla suit experiment and others of its kind have taught us to mistrust our own eyes. What the detective does have is traces that remain, and there is a great deal to trust there. There are footprints, fingerprints, and nowadays DNA fingerprints too, bloodstains, letters, diaries. The world is the way the world should be if this and this history, but not that and that history, led up to the present. The distinction between the two dictionary meanings of theory is not an unbridgeable chasm as many historical examples show. In the history of science, theorems often start off as mere hypotheses. Like the theory of continental drift, an idea may even begin its career mired in ridicule before progressing by painful steps to the status of a theorem or undisputed fact. This is not a philosophically difficult point. The fact that some widely held past beliefs have been conclusively proved erroneous doesn't mean we have to fear that future evidence will always show our present beliefs to be wrong. You are listening to how Muta Baruka. Are depends, among other things, on how strong the evidence for them is. People used to think the sun was smaller than the earth because they had inadequate evidence. Now we have evidence, which was not previously available, that shows conclusively that it is much larger and we can be totally confident that this evidence will never, ever be superseded. This is not a temporary hypothesis that has so far survived disproof. Our present beliefs about many things may be disproved, 
but we can with complete confidence make a list of certain facts that will never be disproved. Evolution and the heliocentric theory weren't always among them, but they are now. Biologists often make a distinction between the fact of evolution, all living things are cousins, and the theory of what drives it. They usually mean natural selection, and they may contrast it with rival theories such as Lamarck's theory of use and disuse, and the inheritance of acquired characteristics. But Darwin himself thought of both as theories, in the tentative, hypothetical, conjectural sense. This was because, in those days, the available evidence was less compelling, and it was still possible for reputable scientists to dispute both evolution and natural selection. Nowadays, it is no longer possible to dispute the fact of evolution itself. It has graduated to become a theorem, or obviously supported fact. But it could still just be doubted that natural selection is its major driving force. Darwin explained in his autobiography how, in 1838, he was reading Malthus's On Population for Amusement. Under the influence, Matt Ridley suspects, of his brother Erasmus's formidably intelligent friend, Harriet Martineau, and received the inspiration for natural selection. Here, then, I had at last got a theory by which to work. For Darwin, natural selection was a hypothesis which might have been right or might have been wrong. He thought the same of evolution itself. What we now call the fact of evolution was, in 1838, a hypothesis for which evidence needed to be collected. By the time Darwin came to publish On the Origin of Species in 1859, he had amassed enough evidence to propel evolution itself, though still not natural selection, a long way towards the status of fact. Indeed, it was this elevation from hypothesis towards fact that occupied Darwin has continued until today there is no longer a doubt in any serious mind and scientists speak, at least informally, of the fact of evolution. All reputable biologists go on to agree that natural selection is one of the most important driving forces, although, as some biologists insist more than others, not the only one. Even if it is not the only one, I have yet to meet a serious biologist who can point to an alternative to natural selection as a driving force of adaptive evolution, evolution towards positive improvement. In the rest of this book, I shall demonstrate that evolution is an inescapable fact and celebrate its astonishing power, simplicity and beauty. Evolution is within us, around us, between us, and its workings are embedded in the rocks of Aeon's past. Given that, in most cases, we don't live long enough to watch evolution happening before our eyes, we shall revisit the metaphor of the detective coming upon the scene of a crime after the event and making inferences. The aids to inference that lead scientists to the fact of evolution are far more numerous, more convincing, more incontrovertible than any eyewitness reports that have ever been used in any court of law in any century to establish guilt in any crime. Proof beyond reasonable doubt, reasonable doubt, that is the understatement of all time. Continent with Mutabaruka, we are listening to now all amends. You know here, continent, the end, the end. Really, why it weird, you know, them thing I had a real love play the whole other book, 14 hours I did, but may I tell you, because sometimes you play them thing I know and it gone past some people you know yeah man because it not so pushy some people you not know, really can't take the, the the intellectualism of certain things you understand so but it's interesting it's interesting for here Richard Dawkins that talk about the evolution and the theorem of it is a serious thing I firmly believe that everything can be proved mathematically. Yes, I firmly believe that. Without a doubt, mathematics is the highest science. Yes. And if you check the creationists or the evolutionists, the two of them will tell you that life starts in Africa. The only difference is that the evolutionists will tell you that the oldest fossil of any human being was found in Ethiopia and it is the woman. 
the evolution, the creationists will tell you, say, the woman come from a man ribs. Yes. The evolution will tell you, say, the evolution will tell you, say, the earth is millions of years old. The creationists will tell you, say, it is 6,000 years old. Now that me can't take. When a man tell me, say, the Bible say, a 6,000, therefore a 6,000. I mean, with all the evidence in front time, with all the, the reality we're, we're in front time, him insists, I tell you, say, the earth is 6,000 year old. Crazy, craziness. <laughs> then some man come tell you, say, when the Bible say, God make the earth in a six days, him tell you, say, well, Muta, you have to understand, you know, that one day is like a thousand years to the Lord, but it's foolishness that, because the Bible specifically said the evening and the morning was the first day. That cannot be six thousand, that cannot be a thousand years. This thing are never making another six day. And that is old time thinking from people who don't want to take new information in them. If you really believe, say, this earth is 6,000 years old and that everything making a six days, something wrong with your brains. May I tell you, something really wrong with your brains. If you really believe, say, everything where they are so making a six day. <laughs> Trust me. I think the biggest news to I personally is this new skeleton that was found in Ethiopia. They are always fine. Hey, there's no doubt. There is no doubt. Oh, yeah, look at me, someone. A new skeleton. <laughs> yeah. It's a new skeleton because they've just fired it. It do. It do to the world they find before, which was Lucy. A Denkenesh. A Denkenesh is the name they give to that skeleton that they found and say it was 3.5 million years old. Well, this one, them say it gone a million years older. So, it's a serious thing because... You know, people here, we are talking all the while, you know, and I say, Ethiopia, 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 and people are saying, look, Rasta thing, Rasta thing. But guess what? Original man. Original man. The place where them call Ethiopia right now, a desert, it start. Human species, civilization, evolve through time and space, through that little place where them call Ethiopia. So it is no wonder it is no wonder that I and I could come right now and look to Ethiopia for our salvation. Yes, it is no wonder. Our salvation did have to come through the oldest point of reference. No one can say nothing about that. And we don't have to legitimize that through the Bible because the Bible is not old. I just the idea the Bible come out. We are talking about ancient, ancient civilization. Millions of years old. It is no accident why Rasta come now and say Ethiopia. Because Ethiopia have so much of the history of human species. That if we look inside at that and say our salvation belongs to Ethiopia and come from Ethiopia and emanate from Ethiopia, who is these people who come tell us different? The story of humankind is reaching back another million years with the discovery of Adi, A I D I, a humanid who lived. 4.4 million years ago in what is now Ethiopia. The 110 pound 4 foot female roamed forests a million years before the famous Lucy long studied as the earliest skeleton of a human ancestor. Now, the older skeleton reverses the common wisdom of human evolution said anthropologist C. Owen Lovejoy of Kent State University. Rather than humans evolving from an ancient chimp-like creature, the new find provides evidence that chimps and humans evolved from some long-ago common ancestor, but each evolved and changed separately along the way. 
This is not the common ancestor. This is not that common ancestor, but it's the closest we have ever been able to come, said Tim White, director of the Human Evolution Research Center at the University of California, Berkeley. The lines that evolved into modern humans and living apes probably shared an ancestor six million to seven million years ago, White said in a telephone interview. But are they as many traits that do not appear in modern day African apes, leading to the conclusion that the apes evolved extensively since we shared that last common ancestor. A study of Adi underway, underway since the first bones were discovered in 1994 indicates the species lived in the woodlands and could climb on all fours along tree branches but the development of their arms and legs indicates they didn't spend much time in the trees and they could walk upright on two legs when on the ground formerly dubbed adipiticus tamidus which means root of the ground ape the find is detailed in 11 research papers published thursday by the journal science this is one of the most important discoveries for the study of human evolution, said David Pilbeam, curator of philanthropical, philanthropology at Avad Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology. It is relatively complete in that it preserves head, hands, feet, and some critical parts in between. It represents a genius plausible ancestral to Australopithecus, itself ancestral to our genius Omo, said Phil Bean, who was not part of the research teams. Scientists, scientists assembled the skeleton from 125 pieces. And the article goes on and on, and I'm sure you a drawing here of what they found. The arms is very long, may I tell you. Long, long arms. But, yes, they are found right there in Ethiopia. Right there in Ethiopia. This, the same place, geographical location where they found Lucy. So, if them go and look and look, if the scientists are evolutionists, then the creationists might search for the first man there and who them perceive are perceived to be God. Yes, I am putting it this way. Maybe I should get a PhD for this now. <laughs> because if the scientist them who is evolutionist, because you have two train of thought, you have the evolutionist and the creationist. There's a school of thought where the creationists believe that there's some entity out there that created the first man. And he's called Adam. And there's the other school of thought, scientifically, that man evolved from apes. According to a Charles Darwin theory that has been scientifically proven that man actually evolved from these apes through the discovery of these bones and parts so my reason is this that if the creation story in the bible when it says eden the garden of eden and it shows you geographically where the garden of eden was in the bible and it mentioned the same land ethiopia and the evolutionist theory scientifically says that they find the first human being in the same location, Ethiopia. Then the probability should arise that we should also look in Ethiopia for the creator of this human species. <laughs> I sir, what am I suggesting here? I am suggesting that Ethiopia is the answer 
to not only to the not only to the creationists, but to the evolutionists. That is what I am suggesting. I am suggesting that if we be practical and true to ourselves, we would look for our beginning through Ethiopia and Marcus Garvey though not being a man who cared very much for the idea that Rasta project did say that we should look to God through our own spectacle through the eyes of Ethiopia Marcus Garvey said that in the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey him say if the white man choose to worship God through his spectacle, let him do it. If the Jews worship God through the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, let do him do it. But we, though let it might be, should worship God through Ethiopia. Now, some people might say that when him say Ethiopia, he wasn't talking about that specific part of the land. But we know that Marcus Garvey hardly declare the whole of Africa as Ethiopia. Because he mentioned Africa as Africa. But on this specific occasion, he mentioned Ethiopia. And I am saying that Ethiopia to the evolutionists is the birthplace of the human species. And to the creationists it is the birthplace of the human species. So why is it implausible to look for, if you're a creationist, thinker, why is it not the possibility that the creator of this creation is not residing in the belly of Ethiopia. And though a lot of people might claim that the Rasta man don't know where I say and do have no sense because he might look for one man and I declare him God. I non apologetically I say it is better to search in the bowels of Ethiopia through your ancestral legacy. And define yourself through Eile Selassie than to imagine vain things about a concept that was given to us by insecure men. Yes. And it's not ordinary for a man come declare Eile Selassie because when you look upon the idea, No. Wait, no, me no, no. Why you are through it, eh? No, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. When you look on the idea that Rasta man declare, it's much bigger than all Rasta too. Much bigger. And it, 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 it just, it just amaze I all people just shun it as some stupid concept. Instead of them looking pan, instead of them look pan the, the fullness of it and the realization of it. But because it has come from a set of people who them claim say, no, I'm not theological background, I'm not educated enough for decipher concepts and ideas. They more want to say we don't have no sense. But the plausibility is there through evolution and through creation story. The plausibility is there. There is a fullness in what the Rasta man is saying about Eilis Lassie and about Ethiopia. There is a fullness. There is a higher level of perception that is not grasped by the normal, everyday person who are thinking about Savior and Jesus and God and all them things there. Serious thing. I mean, I'm a bridge in a talk a while ago about the magnitude of the Rasta idea and not Rasta not Grasp. really grasping the magnitude of the idea. 
You know, see, because because we're coming from a Christian society, most Rasta choose to validate this idea through a biblical perspective. But if you could have just step out of that biblical perspective a moment and realize that what Rasta is saying is 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 is, is like momentous. I mean, if there's such a word, is it like large? And I don't, I don't really think most Rasta understand the magnitude of this concept, this idea that Rasta project upon the world by saying Eilis Lassie. I don't think a whole heap of Rasta understand it. I don't think a whole heap of Rasta understand that saying Eilis Lassie is not just linking a man with a Salomonic dynasty linking a man with biblical perspectives but realizing that it gone it's like a giant it's like a it's like something you ever see a cloud like 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 somebody does kick up dust and it just pours out it just it just it just, it just, may I tell you, it, 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 I mean. That's what they call a snowball effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like snowball around yeah, the running, just, bigger, bigger and bigger and bigger. Because it's a gathered up snow. Because yeah. when you look upon these, when you, when, when you look upon these, um, archaeologists, archaeological findings, and, the, the, all right, first of all, me have some people a reason just this weekend yeah, in a Cincinnati. They are Cincinnati and me a reason for a radio program in a Cincinnati. Why you look the people them in a Cincinnati? Why you? I will say, all right. The evolution show you non apologetically that the world, the earth cannot be 6,000 year old. It is ridiculous. I mean, not even the most sensible. Not even the most ignorant Christian theologian. Only the dark Christian would I tell you that. No. Still. Yeah. After all of this. Yeah. Still. Yeah. If you tell you say the earth is six thousand year old. No. You know, see, I don't even know. I, I, you know, one of the, uh, Ian Boy, I forgot to interview Ian Boy. Yes. Yeah. Because look at you now. The Bible say the earth is six thousand year old. You know, man is six thousand year old. In I'm farm, I'm still here, so no. It means 6,000 years old. That means, according to the Bible, before Adam, there was no man. That is what the Bible is saying. Before Adam, there was no man. So, when the Bible tells you, say, man in his the state to him is now, when he was created, it's so him did stay. That is what it says. And 6,000 years after, him stay the same way. The same look, the same design is just so. God make man. And just how we look now is so God did make man. And 6,000 years of man is where we have for earth. No, believe you me, man. Geologically, archaeologically, anthropologically, there is no way a man in a right sense could have really believed, say, where up in part earth yeah, so no the birds the bees the flowers and the trees is just six thousand year old <laughs> no way you have to be the most stupid and most no irrational mind the, the same man we believe that you know believe say you'd have dinosaurs live 10 million years ago but all can believe that if if, if dinosaurs did live before prehistory them kind of prehistoric no reason it yeah. <laughs> You know, it's a weird thing. So. Him just said, yeah, him said, they have dinosaur. Yeah. Then if they have dinosaur, and the dinosaur was like, I mean, me go at Jerry Corasta. The same wall, the same place. Where them say, round the wall of Jericho, the army went. Seven times the people shout and the wall fall down. Ah, I went to the spot where that wall was. And on entering the city of Jericho. The, and I said this many times on this program, I know. I sound like a parrot now, but I keep repeating the same thing. When we went to this city, when we 
I'm just about to enter the city. There is a sign there that says, Welcome to Jericho, the oldest city on earth, 10,000 year old. That is what the sign say. Welcome to Jericho, the oldest city on earth, 10,000 years old. No. That is 4,000 more than the Bible, man, you know. They have to be man creating cities. And this, these people claim that Jericho is 10,000 years old. If you go to Egypt and look on buildings and structures and human art farms and artwork, it is more than 10,000 years old. You must have man there. For me, eh? Yeah, you must have man there build these things, you know. Therefore, when we are said non apologetically, Rasta come in a him so called ignorance and in a him so called um, poverty stricken position in a this farmer slave plantation island, yeah, so, and say, Emperor Isle Selassie is the Almighty. And him say, Ethiopia at the original, fit him original place. And people scoff at him, shun him. I mean, do all manner of things with him. Without looking into the idea. Because the idea don't originate with the man who ball it out. Yes, so you know. Is a, is is thousands of years the idea linger in the wind, you know. It just come grab some people in this part of the world, yeah. But it's thousands of years the idea they are linking the, a, a linger in the wind. So a man, but I make it come like say it's a joke thing because see there, the creationists and the evolutionists are declare Ethiopia. So. If we never got dig up no soil, somehow we never ever take no plane yet. Most rats have never take a plane yet and left Jamaica. The elder them, when they come up with the idea, never know Ethiopia, but them declare it. We have to really take a stock. All the, all the little people them who are look at Rasta like Rasta, you know, some little ganja smoking, fool, fool, set of people them. We are linked the whole thing through what we call our spirituality, through our experience, not through learning in a book, not through calling nobody, just through the experience and the learning. Where God past Bible, God past Christian thinking, Judaism, Islam, all of these things, them where them set up as as religion for the people them. Rastafari penetrate all of them and gone where in the first original geographical location go find for him redeemer a serious thing this is the cutting edge on RFM blessed